Okay, uh, hi everyone. Welcome to Hacker School. If this is your first time in any Hacker School, Hacker School is basically a series of workshops organized by NUS Hackers where we aim to teach you a certain type of technology or skill. So this week we'll be covering Docker. Right, so yeah. Uh, everyone should have uh, this link. These slides are all published on this website. So if you want to take a look, link is there, QR code if you want to scan it. Yeah, I'll give it like 30 seconds so everyone can access it. And so, uh, if you're using your laptop, at the bottom left there's a download button, you can download it as a PDF as well. So yeah, moving on. Yeah, so I'm Chun Yu, I'm a year 3 computer science undergrad and I'm also part of NUS Hackers. So I'll be helping you through Docker today. And essentially, um, before we start, we need everyone to kind of have Docker installed because I want everyone to kind of go through the commands together. So anyone having trouble, anyone else having trouble installing Docker, just raise your hands and then I think one of the core team members will help. Anyone else? Cool, okay. So uh, we'll cover it in kind of five basic concepts, right? So uh, I'll try and break this, uh, the whole Docker thing into like five things so that we can kind of easily understand what Docker is doing behind the scenes and why we need to use Docker, right? Yeah, uh, what we won't cover is stuff like advanced Docker and concepts, stuff like uh, really, really complex Docker Compose files. I won't cover that. Uh, I won't cover stuff like orchestration tools, Kubernetes, Ansible, stuff like that. Yeah, but most of, most of the basics of Docker we'll cover. So I'll start very simply, uh, what is Docker? So Docker essentially is a piece of software that allows us to run applications in isolated environments known as containers. This might seem like a lot of buzzwords for people who might not have a programming background, but essentially uh, the use case is something like, uh, imagine you have a very cool Python program that you wrote, right? And you want to share it with a friend. So your friend says, hey, send me the Python file. And then you send him the Python file and then he says, oh shit, I can't run it on my computer because I don't have the required Python packages, right? And then you ask him to install the Python, Python package, it's like, oh shit, I'm on a Mac and it doesn't run on a Mac, but it runs on a Windows or something like that. So Docker essentially aims to resolve all these problems by letting you programmatically write out an environment where you can launch that Python script, right? Uh, another kind of use case of Docker is something like a team environment, right? Imagine you just join a company as an intern or a full timer, right? And then they give you a list of 50 things to install. And it becomes very troublesome. You spend like six hours, a six hours of your first day at work just installing programs. All this could have been solved if you have something like Docker, where you just run the Docker container where everything's already pre-installed for you, right? Mm, yeah. So essentially you can think of Docker as a box or package which encapsulates everything that your application needs in the environment, right? So the idea of Docker is we want to uh, write this uh, box or package in some configuration files, which we can then determine our environment that the programs are running in, right? Uh, so some people might ask why use Docker? There's also another solution on the kind of market, which is called, which are virtual machines, right? I won't go into too much detail why you should use Docker or use virtual, mach virtual machines, but essentially, Docker, you can think of Docker as a lightweight version of virtual machines, where we kind of uh, are able to run a mini virtual machine at about 30 times cheaper the cost than a virtual machine, right? If you want to learn more, there's a link to, I think a good blog post about why you use Docker over virtual, content, uh, virtual machines, right? Yeah. Okay, so the first, I think, main concept that Docker really surrounds or is built around is the idea between uh, of images and containers, right? And this idea is simply uh, that images are essentially like blueprints for containers, and containers are runnable instances of images. If you want to kind of have a better way of imagining this uh, relationship, Images will be something like a recipe for, let's say, a cake, right? How to bake a cake, right? Whereas uh, containers are something like executing the instructions to making a cake, right? So with this analogy kind of thing, can multiple containers run the same image? Anyone wants to try and answer? 
no? Okay, so essentially you can, right? Because if you think about like baking a cake, right? Multiple people can bake the same cake using the same recipe. So similar to this, it's like multiple containers can run the same image, right? Another way we can kind of think of it in a more uh, programmer-friendly example is the relationship between an uh, executable file and an application, right? So let's say you have a terminal application, right? Uh, the terminal application itself doesn't run anything, right? It's a executable file. So that is sort of, sort of like your image. And the terminal, is, terminal application itself, when it's running, is sort of like your container. Okay. Yeah, so I want everyone to kind of uh, try this out with me. If you do have Docker installed, you should be able to run this command, uh, command fairly easily. And it should take some time to install. But other than that, you shouldn't find much trouble in running it, right? So it's just a very standard uh, Hello World program or like Hello World container in this sense. Right? Yeah. I'll give everyone like 20 seconds. Anyone got any issues running this or like Docker complaints or anything like that? Just raise your hand, right? Anyone needs, have no experience using the terminal or anything also? Just raise your hand. Everyone got to this page, has got out this print output. Yeah, so essentially what we just did was Essentially, what we just did is uh, run one of the Docker commands, right? Uh, and the way to break down this command is that we have Docker, the main command, which is Docker. And if you notice, when you run Docker alone, you get a list of sub-commands, right? Uh, we will go through a bunch of these later, but I won't be able to finish everything. So if you want to take a look at what else is available, look at this page, right? So the sub-command you're running is Docker run, which is a sub-command that tells it to run, uh, there's a typo here, it's not a program, run an image. In other words, create a container from an image. And in this case, hello world is the special image we want to run. Right? I think someone asked, uh, where, is, where does hello world come from? <laughs> we'll go through that in a bit. Right? But you just need to know that it runs an image, it pulls out, for now we just imagine it pulls out of thin air. Okay? We'll go through where it gets this image from. But yeah, we can try something different or something more useful. Uh, anyone know, doesn't know what Ubuntu is? It's basically like an operating Linux operating system, right? You can think of it. So we can try to run this command, and to break this down, we are just run, using the same command but with a few extra flags, right? So dash i is to indicate interactive mode. Uh, dash t is to kind of indicate tty. You don't need to really understand this. You just need to know every time you run interactive, you just add a t behind, right? And slash bin slash bash is just the command you want to run, right? If you never heard of bash, it's just what you use to start up a terminal. Yeah, so. So if you look at my terminal, you notice that the prompt, the starting prompt has changed. Essentially, I'm inside the container. And you can verify this by looking at just running a command and checking what your OS is. So yeah, so notice it says Ubuntu 22.04. So you can verify that you're in this container, right? Uh, this is a bit of a convoluted example. We can do a maybe a more familiar example. Uh, we can try running different versions of Python. So you notice that we indicate the versions here. Once again, we'll go through in a little bit more detail how we get these version numbers. But if you want to try running a Python environment, this is just docker run dash it for interactive and TTY. 
Python is the name of the image we want to run, 3.8 is the version, and then Python is the command we want to run. Yeah, so you notice I have Python 3.8 running on one and Python 2.7 running on the other one. So with this, you can very easily, you can very easily kind of verify or like indicate what kind of image you want or like what version of Python you want to run your programs in, right? And just to show you, it's not just like a printing error. If you try and run like the old print on each different container, Yeah, you notice that the Python 2.7 can handle like the very ancient way of printing stuff in Python, but 3.8 doesn't, right? Anyone have issues getting to this point, or their images cannot run or anything like that? Uh, just feel free to raise your hand, anything? Otherwise, I'll keep going. Yeah, so that's basically how to run images and basically use an image to turn it into a container, right? Uh, there is a, a particular thing you should notice when you first run a container is, or like run an image, sorry, you see this uh, error message, right? Unable to find image, then there's an image name locally, right? You can just quickly run any kind of image and you see this. Uh, so essentially what is happening is that Docker is running a series of steps, right? Uh, it is looking at, uh, what you have locally, it notices you don't have a particular image, say hello world or Python. It's pulling this from somewhere. So this is uh, the, the, the Docker Hub, but we'll go through that a little bit more later. And then it's running the image that you just installed from the Docker Hub. Right. Mm. So, so you notice that if you rerun the container, like let's say you already have Python 2.7 or Python 3.8, you rerun the container, you no longer get this a uh, message saying unable to find the image locally. Okay. Yeah, so we've played around with two different ways to kind of run a container. There's actually a couple of ways you can run it. Uh, is it? Oh yeah, before that, uh, you can see what containers you have by opening up a separate terminal and running this command, docker ps. Right, so I can just demonstrate for a bit. Yeah, so I haven't closed my Docker uh, Docker image uh, container, sorry. But you notice here, I can show you what uh, is currently running, what image it is, what version it is, what command you're running in it, when it was created, uh, how long it's been up, and the names. Basically, if you don't indicate a name with dash dash name, it will give you a random name. Usually, it's two words. Okay. Yeah, so I'm just going to close one. And if you notice, I run Docker PS again. There's only one container left, right? Anyone confused about this or not sure what's happening? Anyone else? Yeah, uh, you can use different flags to kind of uh, get different outputs. You can there's a this this QR code is just uh, linked to the documentation. But Docker PS A shows you uh, images you run and uh, exited and stuff like that. So I can quickly demonstrate this. Yeah, so you notice I've run a bunch of Docker containers prior to starting this, right? Okay. Yeah, moving on. So we have different modes where you can run Docker. We've seen uh, running it default without any flags. We've seen uh, being able to launch a program using the interactive mode, your dash IT. And then we also have uh, another mode of doing it, basically running it detached, right? And this, uh, the difference between the detached mode and the interactive and default mode is that uh, if you notice in the interactive or detached mode, the output of the terminal will print directly to your terminal. Whereas if you do something like a detached flag, 
the command or like any output or print statement so print not in your terminal and we have to retrieve it manually right so i have um, yeah so this is uh just a container for it to run in just different modes right so a few more flags here and there uh dash dash rm just remove the container after you've done uh, your, your, you finish it uh finish running your commands uh, dash dash name as you mentioned before gives it a name and dash p uh, publishes any open ports. If you don't know what ports are, we'll explain it a bit later as well. So, yeah. So try running uh, these three commands separately and see the differences if you can see any. Yeah. Uh, let me run it for you. Okay, uh, you can oh, sorry. get the slides, oh, get the slides, yep, and then if you just follow along, if you need help, just raise hands or during a break, I'll help you, so there's a short break in between, yeah, yeah. yeah uh, so for those who just came, you can access the slides here, Yeah. They just give you a note for okay. Okay. okay, yeah, back to here. Right, you should uh for those who just can you can you should be able to if you have Docker installed, you just run the command straight out of the box. But if you notice the difference between these three con containers is in the default mode and the interactive mode, we have this Nginx is running output, right? Whereas in this uh, detached container, we don't see any output. Right? And to see the output, you can use something called Docker, Docker logs, right? So you do Docker logs, and you need to get the name of your, you need to get the name of your Docker container. In this case, we've named it static site very conveniently. So you can see the output is here, right? Mm, okay, wait. Yeah. So now if you run uh, Docker PS, you notice uh, for the detached container in particular, you see this really weird symbols and numbers on your Docker ports, right? And essentially what dash P did is it looks for open ports on your computer and allows you to map to it, right? So we'll explain it in a bit more detail when we are actually manually mapping ports. But for now, you can just go to whatever your port says here. Right, so 0, .0, 0, 0 dot whatever. So yours might be slightly different. For me, it's three two seven six nine, right? And if you go there, oops, sorry. Yeah, you should be able to see something like this. So your entire this entire like web page should be running out of your Docker container. Right. So everyone just try and see if you can uh, get this uh, port here and then run it using uh, HTTP slash slash localhost and then the port number. Uh, before I move on, any last issues getting to the site? You try to 443. Okay. Yeah, so uh, I think there were quite a lot of questions, uh, good questions actually, like what does this mean, like uh, Praka 1989 slash slash slash, what does this mean? We'll go through that later. Uh, what does dash p do? Uh, why does 
uh, does it run, uh, why the interacting mode and default mode runs the same? In this case, it will run the same thing. But you notice when you run like a Python container, running without interactive and running it with, with like just the default flags, it's very different things. Yeah. Um, oh yeah, so if you want to, another way to check the port is other than using Docker, PS is also using Docker port slash with the image name. So the image name is what you specify in your dash dash name, or in your Docker PS, you can see the random name it gives your uh, container, right? You can also, if you have Docker desktop installed, you can open up Docker desktop and take a look at what name was assigned. Yeah, and most importantly, how do you stop a detached container? You will need to manually stop it using uh, commands. So docker stop, and then docker rm just removes it from memory. So just to quickly demonstrate this, So if I do docker stop static site, it will stop the one with the name static site here. Right? And so if I do docker ps again, notice that there's only two containers left. So, but if you notice, if I do docker ps a, which kind of shows everything, you should be able to find a container with the name static site. So what uh, docker rm does is it, re it removes the container completely from memory. So if you do something like docker rm static site, now you can no longer find that container. So that's what's the difference between uh, stop and rm. Yeah. No, so it just remains in memory. Uh, yes, so to know what images you downloaded, just do docker images. We'll go through this in a bit. But yeah, you can see like a bunch of docker images are downloaded. And then you can just delete them afterwards. Uh, yeah, so there's a command towards the end of the workshop where after we're done everything, I'll just show you the command to delete everything for convenience. But yeah. Yeah, so docker stop and docker rm, the difference here is that uh, Docker RM will remove it completely from memory, so you have no history of being ever installed or run on your local machine. Right. So, uh, by the way, I'll use many uh, many different terms to refer to your own laptop. Right. I'll say local machine, local host, host, whatever. It all means the same thing. It's just your computer. Yeah. And to remove uh, image manually one by one is Docker RMI for remove image, and then the image name. Yeah, so that's kind of the main idea behind images and containers. I hope that wasn't too confusing. This is a summary for all the commands. You will ever need to refer to this workshop anytime when you're using Docker, right? Mm. Yeah, so the next kind of concept aims to kind of uh, resolve the uh, query of what does, what does Prakar 1989 slash static site mean? And where do we get hello world out of thin air, right? And the answer to both of these questions is the Docker Hub, right? And the Docker Hub is essentially a central repository of images that we can use. By default, uh, this is the main, uh, the correct term for this is registry Docker users. If you go work in a large corporation or like a internship company, right, they might have their own version of the Docker Hub somewhere in their own servers. So they ask you to change the registry. This is what this means. But in general, when you first install Docker, everything's connected to the Docker Hub, right? So if you go to hub.docker.com, you see a page like this, and you search for, let's say, what container do you run? We ran Hello World. You see the Docker image is right here, right? And there's a bunch of uh, references, uh, tags about the and we'll go through this in a bit more detail. Uh, if you look at the Python image, right, there's a Docker page for this. And I think uh, something interesting to point out is that you see there's a lot of different tags beyond just 3.8, 2.6, right? There's also, it doesn't have to be numbers, your tags. And the tag is basically what you added at the end of your command, right? With the colon and then 3.8, right? You can also add like 3.8 dash, or 3.13 dot 
zero A four Windows Server call, which probably installs Docker for Windows or some uh, Python for Windows or something. Uh, is that like What do you mean? Oh, so uh, for Docker it doesn't matter. So you can add in any order. Yeah, whatever flag you have, you can add in any order, as long as you don't do dash p and then you don't indicate a uh like you do like dash dash name and then you don't write a name, then you go to another flag. Then that might return an error, right? Uh, yeah. So I wanted to show you the Python image. Because uh, if there's a special, I think, for this image, there's a special uh, feature that not all containers have, or images have, is that if you notice, uh, if you go to the tags page, you notice that every tag has a diff has a multiple images for different architectures, right? So if you're using an M1 Mac, you can run uh, this Python image in ARM, which is just what M1 Max, M1, M2, M3 Max use, right? So you should be able to run this without any issues. Uh, whereas uh, for most computers or laptops, Windows laptops, you'll be using uh, AMD64, right? Uh, you should be able to emulate uh, between the two. So an M1 Mac can emulate uh, AMD64 and uh, AMD64 laptops should be able to emulate ARM on Docker. But I think for M1 MacBooks, as I think the people sitting there discovered, uh, there seems to be some issue with the emulation. I don't know why. Yeah, it could be an a version thing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So essentially, what you're doing whenever you do Docker pool is you're getting all your images from Docker Hub, and then you're running it, right? And uh, the naming convention is such as anything that is labeled in Docker Hub, oops, anything that is labeled in Docker Hub with the Docker official image here. Basically, you just need to type the name and it should appear. So this is stuff like Python. Ubuntu, Nginx, right? Or any other thing you can search on Docker Hub. If you have community images, these are images provided by third party uh, companies or just random users, right? This is where you have the username slash image tag, right? So this is where kind of uh, propcar1989 slash that site comes from, right? You can find a bunch of other Docker containers. Uh, through Docker Hub, just by searching and looking at what you want, right? Here are some like fun examples, I guess. Uh, okay, before that, uh, you can run like different versions of Python. You notice there's Python 3.8, Slim, Alpine. Uh, you can just play around with them, see what the different versions have. Generally, um, for like these three images, you notice that the sizes of the images are quite different, right? And you can read up on the Python Docker Hub to know what's the like the, the minute differences between the different versions. Right? Um, yeah, uh, so this is the platform. Uh, official by right you should be able to run different um, architectures based on what you indicate in the dash dash platform. So you should be able to run uh, let's say ARM64 or on your x86 laptop and x86 on your M1 Mac MacBook laptop. If this number sound confusing, uh, it's okay. You can just ignore this part. But yeah, mm, yeah. So just to show you some of, I don't know, uh, more like cool or funny uh, community images. You can kind of try in running this uh, once again without the comments, right? So I can just show you. Yeah, so the first command just let uh, first command just lets you run space invaders on your terminal. So you don't even know what it's how they built it or why they or like what dependencies is required. You just are able to run it in your terminal. Right. So you can shoot, you can move around. Uh another slightly weird but I think uh fun community image is this Star Wars image which basically just plays the first 20 minutes of Star Wars on your terminal. Yeah, so uh, I think we'll just play around with them. You can go on Docker Hub, search for other fun, useless images you want to run, and just try running them.
Yeah. So uh, I've already pulled these images, so it will be a lot faster to kind of run this. But if you run it on your computer, you might see it takes a while to install. Yeah. So any issues running these content uh, images or any other images you find on Docker Hub, feel free to raise your hand. Then we'll go by and help you. Okay, uh, any last issue before I move on? Uh, feel free to raise your hand. Okay, um, just gonna move on. Yeah, so you notice so far the Docker images we've shown are quite simple, and I've been doing that on purpose so to avoid going through some concepts. So if you look at more advanced use cases or like more complex Docker images, right? You might notice that some of times, uh, if you want to run like useful programs, right? You will need something like let's say it does something like download a file. It's a bit hard to use Docker because uh, it's actually what Docker is, is a box, remember? So you install everything in the box, your host computer doesn't have actually have access to the file that Docker, like the image or like the application the image downloaded. So this is kind of where we're going to the concept of volumes and networks, right? What if you want to expose the Docker container, that's where we use ports, or what, what if we want to get some output file that the Docker container downloads or produces. Right. Yeah, so volumes are basically Docker's method of sharing storage between your local computer and the Docker container itself. Right. Uh, essentially, uh, we just add it to the list of flags we already have in our Docker run. We use a dash v or dash dash volume, and then you indicate the host directory location and where the Docker directory location is. Anyone not familiar with directories or command line directories? So essentially, to find your own directory, you can just, uh, in your terminal, you just do print working directory, directory, pwd. I think in Windows, it'll be dir or something like that, yeah. But you can see, this is my home directory. So if I want to expose this folder to Docker, I'll just do docker run, dash v, slash home, slash home, slash, and then this goes to a directory inside docker, right? So, and then I'll just do the rest of my commands. Yeah, so uh, I'm gonna give you guys an exercise to just try and let you figure out kind of how it works. Oh wait. Yeah, so this is a really cool uh, Docker container that basically gives you a UI to download YouTube videos with but you need to access the YouTube videos in your own local computer as well right so I'll give you the Docker directory uh, location in the Docker which is slash downloads and you need to map this to your host computer somewhere in your host computer so this is the base uh, command and you just need to fill in where your volumes are Right. So take like five minutes and try and do this. Yeah. So some new flex dash p. I mean uh, dash v is just the volumes and dash p is something we'll cover right after this. Right. And you notice this is no longer Docker Hub, but it says ghcr.io. This is essentially GitHub, GitHub's version of Docker Hub. So you can kind of use different images from different places just by indicating a URL. Yeah. Yeah. So, if you haven't done already, basically what you need to do is just map this to some directory. In this case, I have a directory set up already. Right. So something like this will work if you have. Uh, spaces in your directory like Windows uh, space. Uh, you want you might want to code the whole thing. So this will allow you to have spaces in your directory name, right? But otherwise, uh, uh yeah. So Windows also uses uh, backspace instead of forward space. But these are just like minute differences between Windows directory structures and you know, directory structures. But this should just work, right? So if you go to
Yeah. So if I install like a random video, I will find a random video. I should be able to see this, and you notice I already tried this previously, so you can see it here. So if you go. Yeah, you can see it downloaded here. I can just give a demonstration of it. <laughs> yeah, so the back end still works Yeah, so anything that's running, it just runs in a container. But the downloaded files are shared between the container and your own host machine. Oh, the downloaded files is inside your. Yeah, exactly. So that's the idea behind volumes. So you can see it's downloading. And I have, okay, wait, I can just remove it. not able to get your mp3 or mp4 downloaded video on your folder somewhere. Wait, I'll just walk around. If anyone need help, just raise your hand. Yeah. And so uh, this is a simple demonstration of it. Uh, but the idea behind networking in containers is quite similar as well. So you notice we use dash p or dash capital P a lot of times. Essentially, this is passing network traffic into the Docker container. So for people with no networking experience at all, uh, basically uh, how networking works, let's say you connect to a website, what you're doing is actually connecting to another computer sitting in a server room somewhere, right? But it's not only connecting to a certain computer, you're connecting to a certain port on the computer. You can think of it like a doorway. So depending on which port or which door you, you connect to in the other, other, um, on the other host net, a host computer, you might either get a web page or a Minecraft server or something else completely, right? So it all depends on your port. So for example, whenever you connect to, let's say, google.com, you're actually connecting to a server somewhere on port 443 specifically, or port 80, right? So uh, to expose your, I guess, network traffic from Docker to your local host, you want to essentially map the port, the Docker port where the traffic is coming out from, to some of your like one of your ports in your local machine. So it's quite similar to how you map uh, volumes, right? So it's just your host port and then your uh, your Docker port. So you might already seen when you do dash p, what dash capital p, sorry, what it essentially does is it finds an open port on your computer and exposes and uses that. A random open port. That's why you will see everyone has a different uh, port when you do dash capital P. When you do dash small letter P, you get to choose which port you want to expose. Right? So uh, I think a couple of you might have run this as well. When you run um, this multiple times, you notice the second time you run this, you'll complain that the port is already used because each port can only have one application attached to it. Right? So this is actually dash P. 8081, 8081 is mapping the Docker container 8081 port to your host 8081 port, right? You don't need to know too much about how ports work, but you just need to know that uh, one computer might have different applications on the network. So to differentiate which application is running, we have different ports for it, right? Yeah, so that's essentially the idea of ports. We have a similar exercise. Okay, so if I map it to 8080 instead, uh, let's say you can just go to localhost colon 8080 and it should give you the same results, right? Uh, so an exercise, this is like a PDF utility run in a Docker file. Can you figure out uh, what the port is, right? So just to speed things up a bit, we know that the Docker container uses port 8080. So the command will look something like Oops. 
this. So uh, yeah, sorry, without the text yeah, So we'll try figuring out, see whether you can get it showing on your web page. So essentially, uh, the idea here is just that you just run whatever port you want here and you should be able to see it. So I'll run like 8082. Oops. Yeah, you can see it runs that on my machine here. So, just a recap. So it's just whatever port you want, and then you just write it in your terminal. Right. So yeah. So this is the we have like a five minute break since I ran stop. Uh, kind of. Yeah, uh, if you need to go to the toilet, go just, uh, you yeah, can just go now. Yeah, in the meantime, if you want to play around with Docker, here are like a few random cool Docker containers you can run. Uh, this is uh, kind of a typing test, and this is just running VS Code on your web page. You're going to try it. But yeah, I'm going to keep going on. Yeah, so. Yeah, so we've kind of explored the idea of. Uh, the Docker images playing around with port, uh, ports and volumes. So now we're gonna try writing images from scratch, right? So so far we've what we've been doing is right using pre-built uh, Docker images by people who published it on Docker Hub. But now we kind of we want to write our own programs and then write our own environments around it, right? So what if we want to create our own images for our own like Python script or our web page or whatever? So a Docker file is basically a way for us to write configuration that uh, allows us to like basically configure the right environment around the program we have to run and then create a Docker image, right? So uh, you can click on this link if you are interested. But this is just a cool Docker container that allows you to connect to wireless SG without an app, without without the wireless SG app. And this is basically a Docker file they wrote for it, right? And you can kind of learn a bit about the syntax. So, uh, most Docker files will always start with this from keyword, right? And basically what this says is that you want to pull from the image from Docker Hub. So in this case, we are pulling from Python 3, right? We are pulling from Python 3 image and then we are doing some modification on top of whatever's already in this image, right? We want to install some certain package, right? We want to copy a single file and then we want to run it. So entry point is kind of how you start an application in a Docker image. This is equivalent to running kind of Python 3 WASG register.py, right? But you just write it in like a weird list. So I'm just gonna quickly show you. So this is just a uh, kind of a Docker a Python script that does something, right? You, you don't really, it's not really relevant what it does, right? And then in our Docker file, we have something like, this, right? So now we have a Docker file that installs all the packages we need, uh, copies the folder. So in this case, uh, Docker will always copy the folder relative to the folder that you put the Docker file in. In this case, this folder, right? And then you run a uh, Python, uh, run a command. It has Python wsg uh, register .py, right? So now we have a Docker file. We want to build it into an image. Uh, to do so, we just run Docker dash uh, Docker build dash t. Dash t is just a short form for indicating an image name, right? And then uh, the current directory. In this case, that's dot. So it just means current directory. You can use a, a full directory name, up to you, right? So, I can do something like this. Okay, I'm just gonna name it something different, right? Let's say WASG, right? And in this case, I can just use, uh, wait one sec. I 
I can do something like this, right? So this indicates where the Docker file is. This indicates uh, uh, what the name of the image is. And basically what Docker does, it looks for this uh, capital D Docker file in this directory and then builds it. Yeah, so if you notice, you can see uh, it is downloading Python 3, the image, as we indicated here. It is installing. You can see run pip3 install. It's installing a package just inside the container. And then it's copying a file. And then it's just running the, uh, the command. You can't really see it here, right? Or like it's not running a command, but it's getting ready to run a command. So whenever I want to run the image, remember, uh, image is not a runnable instance. A container is. So if I want to run a container based on the image, I just docker run image, like we already did. Yeah, uh, in this case, for this Python script, you need to indicate like, your phone number and everything. But I'm not going to do that because I don't want people to know my phone number. So, yeah. So, if you want to give it a shot, I can give it a shot and then it will give you like, a username and password for YSLSG. So, you never have to download the app ever again. Yeah. Uh, but that's just an example of a Docker file. I will give another slightly more complex example. This is the Docker file for the Space Invaders game we tried and run just now, right? So now we see it's built in Go, right? So it starts with building uh, from Golang. Uh, the maintainer is just uh, just a piece of kind of metadata you can add on to your Docker file, right? Some interesting, the more kind of interesting uh, lines of, of configuration is from something like EMV, which basically sets environment variables. If you remember, it is just a global, super global variable. Right, and and slash basically lets you run run multiple commands in a single go, right? So when you have a single run, you're running one command, but if you want to have multiple commands run at the same time, you just do n n backslash and then you run another command, right? And then CMD is kind of like a alter many people use it as an alternative to entry point, which shouldn't be the case. Uh, basically, what you usually do is like you use entry point first, and if you have additional commands you want to pass into the program, use CMD. But in this case, you can use CMD to start a program as well. Right, so this is a, this is a very brief overview of what a Docker file should look like. And once again, if you want to try it, you can just go to the guy's GitHub, just build it and then run it. But you can also just run the Docker image, which is built from this Docker file. Right, so now we're going to try writing our own Docker file. Uh, essentially, uh, if you go to this link here, it's a short link, hopefully. Didn't include a uh, QR code, but yeah, it should give you a zip file for a random Python app or a Flask app in this case. Right? You want to kind of do these steps basically. Yeah, so you want to use Python in this case. You remember uh, to start with a Python image, you just indicate from Python and then what version you want. Uh, you want to run the command to help you install packages. Right, you want to expose port 5000. Right? I think someone was asking me how Docker knows uh, what traffic to run, or where, which, which ports are open. Uh, basically, when the maintainer or whoever created the Docker file first creates the Docker file, you need to explicitly write what ports you want traffic to come out of. So this way, Docker also knows which ports are, have traffic. And then run a command. You can use CMD, you can use entry point here. Right. So give it a shot, try writing a Docker file, and then try building it and running it. Yeah, and if you need uh, help on, you don't know what some of the commands do, like you don't know what run does or something, just go to this page here. Just Google uh, Docker file reference, and it gives you a list of different steps you can add to your recipe, basically. Uh, in interest time, I'll give like three, four minutes, but you can try this at home. Yeah. So. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, if you have a zip file, when you open the zip file or you unpack the zip file, you should have something like.
something like this without a Docker file. So you just write a Docker file inside the folder where you extract it. Right, okay. And then you just build it from inside here. Small Docker file we want to write. Right? Essentially, you want to use Python 3.8 or 3 or whatever. As long as you don't use Python 2, I think it should be fine. Right? Uh, we want to use a copy command to copy all the items into our directory. This is similar to what we did in, or what you saw in the first one, where we kind of copy a file. We can also copy full directories over. We're going to change our directory to where we copy it over. In this case, if you copy to slash, just not slash root, you should be able to do it without um, changing directory. And then we want to run our command, just pin install. Right. Expose and then run the command or, exp or entry point. Either works. Right. Okay, so essentially you're just create, creating a like copying it to a directory called slash app. You can make it anything, honestly. And then you're changing it, changing the build process directory to slash app. So it's going to pip install from slash app slash requirements, if that makes sense. Yes. So you can put it, you can put, it, put it anywhere really. You can do it. Yeah. Uh, there isn't really a standard. It's just people, many people have different styles. Some people do slash app, you just do root, so you can do. Uh, you can just do root, and then this just will be root. Right. Anything works. I'm, ju I'm just using a random name to put everything. Right. And so, just to show you this works, you can just do docker build test here. Right. Docker run test. And then we want to expose 5,000. Right. No, okay. Oops. No, okay, this works. And if you go to TTP, localhost 5001, you just get a cat GIF. So this, if you have this, you can you will know that your Flask app is working. Uh, yeah, so if you want, you can just use a slide. If there's a copy button here, just copy the entire thing and then try running it yourself. Right, uh, because we are a bit short on time, I'll move forward. Yeah, yeah so uh, that's kind of the idea behind Docker with files. If there are a bunch of kind of recipe steps that I didn't go through, you can take a look uh, over here, right? So uh, stuff like health check, right? What does it do? You can do stuff like shell, a user, you can map the volume here. So instead of doing dash V, you can just map the volume directly in the Docker file, right? There's different stuff like that, right? So I'm not gonna cover too much. Yeah. Uh, so the next idea I want to cover, like the f just the final idea I want to cover, is Docker Compose, which is kind of a wrapper around Docker. So if you notice, I know, this is uh, uh, a Docker container I wanted to show during break time, but essentially it just runs a VS Code instance on the web, right? So I can just quickly show you. <coughs> Four, 
it's just VS Code, but on your web page, right? Which is pretty cool. But then also you notice how long this uh, command is. <coughs> and so one of the problems of Docker in its early stages was that these commands got really, really, really long, right? When you want to have multiple uh, environment variables, multiple ports, uh, multiple volumes you want to map, right? And so Docker Compose aims to kind of tackle this problem, where what if I want uh, multiple containers to run at the same time? What if I want to connect multiple containers together? That's kind of the idea behind Docker Compose, right? And basically, it's a wrapper around uh, Docker where we can write the uh, flex over here into their own configuration file, and then it helps us run multiple Docker containers, right? So what we use is something called a Docker dash compose dot yaml. If you ever see this in a code base, you know you're using they're using Docker, you're using Docker compose, right? It's a standard naming convention for the file, right? And essentially, it looks something like this, which is quite scary, but basically we're going to break it into three parts. The first part, uh, it will almost always be version three. Basically, this is the kind of different versions of Docker Compose, not the different versions of your app. So basically different versions have different uh, variables available to you inside your services and your volumes, right? And the second section will be your services. This is where you define your Docker container, right? So you notice uh, image is sort of like uh, the image you want to run here, right? Uh, something like uh, container name is our dash dash name. Uh, environment is our dash e. Uh, ports is similar to how we write uh, dash p. And then volumes is similar to how we write dash v. It's just all our flags um, written in a single text file. So we no longer have to copy and paste uh, something like this. Right? Instead, we can just write it in a text file and run the text file or like run the configuration file every time we want to run a container. Yeah, so in our container, once again, we have image, we have command, we have environment, uh, we have ports, volumes, and depends on. Depends on is a really special one, where let's say we have two different uh, containers, but we want one container to build before the second container. Maybe they have the same volume, right? And it needs to do something with the volume before we run it. So that's where we want to use depends on, right? And yeah, so here's a, this is a bit of a convoluted example. Here's a simple, Alright, um, yeah. I'm not going to do this exercise. If you want to do it, you can just try it. But essentially, it's just like this, right? So, uh, if you know, uh, we saw this command, uh, we want to map the name. So, our name goes here, container name, code server. Uh, if you want to map uh, the environment variables, you just put it in dash uh, environment and then you just list out all the environment variables. If you want to map a port, or in this case, uh, this is wrongly written as capital P, but yeah, dash p, it was just eight four three eight four three, and then we have something called restart unless stop, which is a very useful uh, kind of function of Docker Compose, where you restart it, uh, you start the container even if we let's say stop the uh, even if we reboot our entire laptop or something like that, right? Or if something goes wrong with the container, it crashes, you just reboot it. Yeah, and then to start and stop with Docker Compose is just Docker compose up, Docker compose down, and then yeah, and to re rebuild the whole thing is just Docker compose up dash dash force recreate. Let me just give you a demonstration. Yeah, so for Docker Compose, you start with this subcommand, Docker Compose. And then if you want to build from a specific uh, Docker Compose file, you can do dash F. And then uh, where the Docker Compose file is. So if this is in a folder, I'll just go slash folder, slash whatever to Docker Compose. And then I'll call build. Or if you, if you are familiar with kind of how Docker already works, you can just run it using up, and then you, if you can't find the uh, the build image, you just build it by itself, right? Oops. Alright, it's already running, but... Oh.
Yeah. So I just need to stop the previous code server and remove it. Yeah, so it just builds it for us and then if you go to localhost 8443, it should just be there. Yeah, uh, it looks like nothing changed, but yeah, it's just a new instance of it. Yeah, um, so that's kind of Docker Compose uh, in a nutshell. It's basically a wrapper on Docker. It has the very, it has almost the exact same concepts behind Docker, just that it's a wrapper for all the flags that Docker kind of uses, right? So it addresses the pain point of just using pure vanilla Docker. Uh, yeah, so uh, another way you can do it, let's say you have a really, really complex problem and you don't want to use uh, pre-built images. You can specify a certain Docker file to build from. So here's something like a uh, partial Docker dot compose, uh, Docker compose by and all. Right, and so you notice uh, you have stuff like a uh, Docker file, right? And context is basically which directory. So you notice our work there step in Docker. This is essentially uh, that, but in Docker compose. Right, we can expose, which basically just maps 8080 to 8080 and 8081 to 8081. It's just a simpler way of writing it. And aside from that, we have uh, some additional variables where you can find on the Docker Compose reference, also on the Docker website. Right, and this is actually uh, the Docker Compose for NUS mods, if you ever use NUS mod before. Right, so I don't have much time, but essentially, if you want to try running uh, Docker Compose, uh, doc, uh, running NUS mod locally on your computer. You can actually use it, you can run it using Docker Compose. Yeah, so I uh, have it, you need to modify a few variables, but I just wanted to show you basically how you can use Docker for development or just deploying random shit on your computer. Yeah, so I have the NUS code base, NUS mods code base on my computer. You notice uh, they have their own Docker Compose for production, which is what they deploy on their servers, and for development, which is just a standard Docker Compose. So if I run something like, yeah, all right, so you, it's going too fast. But you notice, um, essentially it runs uh, three different Docker containers. It runs a Docker container called website, it runs a Docker container called Proxy. Uh, okay, it only runs two containers. I mean, yeah, it runs two containers, basically. And then with that, we can uh, basically run uh, the whole of NUS mods uh, on our laptop. So I forgot which port this exposes. Let me check. Uh, it exposes port 8080 and 8081. So, wait, is the correct one? Yeah, wait, it might be. So if you go to notice you can basically with one Docker container you can run the entirety of any mod on your laptop. Right. So uh, the idea here is that you can use uh, the knowledge you have today to run large code bases without ever knowing what the dependencies are. Uh, what the build steps are, all these are kind of abstracted out in a Docker Compose or a Docker file, and basically you can just start developing. Let's say you are a developer for AS mods, you never have to know uh, anything about dependencies, anything about uh, the build process. You just need to run the Docker file, run the Docker Compose file. You have AS mods here, so you can start modifying the web page as you develop, right? So that's kind of the idea behind uh, Docker Compose, right? So. Uh, it's a bit of a rush because I wanted to end on time. And yeah, and last but not least, you notice you've downloaded a lot of images. If you do uh, Docker images, you notice you have just a bunch of Docker images stored here and you don't want to manually remove and some of them take like one gigabyte. So it, it takes quite a bit of space. If you just do Docker systems prune A, you basically delete every image you have in your computer. So that's just a way to run out of the workshop. Uh. Oh, great. 
of the system we know. Yes, I made a mistake there. And it should free up like 7 gigabytes of space. About 3 gigabytes, I'd say. Yeah. So that's how you just clear out if you ever run out of space. And that's about it. Uh, the last portion of the workshop was a bit rushed, but hopefully uh, you have an idea behind how Docker files and Docker Compose uh, works. If you want to try writing, I would recommend you uh, try and write out or like fix NUS mods uh, Docker Compose so you can run it on your own machine. There are a few variables you need to change around. Uh, other than that, uh, there are some, uh, a quick summary before we go there. Uh, Docker is basically a application for us to containerize our applications and uh, Docker files are basically how we want to write them and Docker Compose is kind of a wrapper around Docker, right? Uh, if you want to explore more on how to deploy like a full set, front end, back end, everything, you can look at Docker curriculum. They have, they have quite a good uh, explainer on it. Uh, something I want, kind of want to show if you want to try practicing uh, using Docker Compose is this uh, GitHub link. And basically, it gives you a bunch of uh, different Docker Compose, which you need to modify slightly here and there to run random stuff like a password manager or a Counter Strike server or a. I don't know, what else do they have here? Uh, paste bin, your own paste bin on your own local machine. So, if you want to look at uh, how to deploy slightly more advanced Docker Compose files, you just look at something like this and see what they do. You notice it's quite similar to what we've already gone through with a few additional uh, variables here and there. Yeah. Uh, aside from that, uh, before you go, uh, we do have a feedback form. So do let us know if you have any feedback for the workshop. Yeah. And last but not least, uh, I think, I'm not sure what the next hacker school is. Oh, okay, nothing. Yes, but we do have our Friday hacks coming out. Uh, this Friday, so if you're free, do join us. I believe it's about. I actually don't remember. Uh, let me check. Uh, it is about arbitrage in crypto. Yes, so if you're interested in that, come back, come down on Friday. Yeah, uh, aside from that, thanks for coming down today for the full two hours. I didn't think I'll take the whole time. Once again, uh, we we'll love your feedback on the workshop. And yeah, sorry? For which one? Uh, it's a very long Google form, so just scan the QR code. I don't, I don't, do you have the, is that, your, is that a shortened URL for this? Yes, yes, there is, there is. Uh, okay, wait, uh, one second. See you. Yeah, uh, if you have any questions about Docker or anything, just feel free to stay, uh, stay around. Yeah. Wait, it's not here. Wait, it's here, it's here. Yeah. This one. Oh, oops, I forgot to include that. <laughs> Feedback. Yeah, uh, this is the shopping link if you ever need it. Uh, yeah, what do you think, Uh Thanks a lot. Yeah. Yeah, stop the recording.